ladies and gentlemen welcome to the next session our next session is going to be on the sustainability of energy supply and we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers for you uh <clears throat> we're going to have uh, mr ashok bilani first who will speak about the energy transition then we're going to have soma soma sundaram who's going to speak about digital chemistry solutions followed by ramesh maini who will speak about <clears throat> reinventing engineering so we start off with uh, ashok who will share his thoughts with us on the energy transition it's my absolute great honor to introduce ashok ashok bilani evp new energy of slumberger limited ashok is responsible for the deployment of differentiated technologies to decarbonize exploration and production operations with carbon neutral technologies this includes early ventures for investment in businesses with the potential for new energy technology development leveraging slumberger's expertise in oil and gas and new domains in new energy ashok joined slumberger in 1980 and if i go through the various positions he held i'll probably take up the entire 25 minutes is a phenomenal career but suffice it is to say that he held a variety of senior positions too numerous to name uh but an interesting one that i did pick up he also managed the semiconductor business of slumberger in california where he held led a leveraged buyout to a private equity firm listed the company on nasdaq and then sold it to creden systems ashok did his btech in electrical engineering from iid delhi and holds a graduate degree in petroleum engineering from stanford my little personal addition to each introduction as you know that i'm want to do ashok has been my personal friend my hostel mate in college and mentor since 1979 ladies and gentlemen give it up for ashok bilani thank you sandeep uh well as you see sandi is uh the chair of this conference and uh so if um, i may not have done very many other things very well but at least uh, sandi is a good product of of my friendship at least um so i'm going to take uh, well first of all thank you to all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all and uh the bad news about uh, talking on zoom is that you don't have this personal sort of touch with the audience but the good news is that you can speak to a whole lot of people without getting intimidated so uh, you can have a casual conversation so in this casual conversation what i intend to do uh, we did create this new business group in my company for new energy and uh, since we are all engineers uh, we understand uh, what the world is trying to do as far as when we talk about the term energy transition where we are basically trying to reduce the carbon footprint that we cause from our life on this planet where we would reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uh, there therefore stop the warming and at the same time do the same to the oceans because the oceans take most of the carbon dioxide and the warming that we affect into the atmosphere so this term energy transition i'm going to use some slides because if i just talk to you i wouldn't leave any images in your minds that are significant so uh, let me let me put some slides on on can you see my slides okay so uh first of all the most important idea that i want to throw at you is that this energy transition whereby the world is going to start using energy sources which have low carbon content or no carbon content to reduce our carbon dioxide footprint in the atmosphere and the oceans uh it is a pretty complex uh uh state transition and it will take a long period of time and a lot of effort and the so uh the if we i took this uh, slide from uh, one of the agencies which kind of maps out the landscape over which this energy transition uh, does affect itself so uh, and in order to give you the idea that because all many of the commodities on the left hand side 
coming from the technologies which are on the right hand side, they affect, aff affect almost all walks of life. Of course, they change the power infrastructure to solar and wind and so because solar and wind have different duty cycles, they affect the storage and then basically decentralize the energy because there are lots of sources, lots of uh, places it comes from. There are many things that affect in the, in the world. At the same time, because uh, energy needs is a fundamental thing for transport, uh, you need a carrier for the energy from the electron to, to something that you can take to the point of use of the energy. It affects mobility in a very significant way, all forms of mobility. It affects the industries, many different industries quite significantly. It affects heating and cooling of buildings and uh, it affects agricultural and many other industries. In there. So if you were to create the landscape of all the changes that would be caused if you fundamentally change the sources of energy, it is quite a large landscape that you have to actually transform. So the energy transition is not only switching some energy sources from, let's say, fossil fuel based sources to uh, clean energy sources. It is actually a transformation of all the associated applications that use this energy. And because energy is so fundamental to practically every walk of life and every industry and all mobility, it actually creates a large transition for the whole world in how it functions and how it lives and how it uh, actually provides value. So I'm going to take four charts and they talk about the energy mix, the electrification story, the carriers that are needed to be able to transport energy and energy efficiency technologies, which are the largest change that will happen uh, to create um, an image in your mind of how you could say paraphrase or parse what we call this huge phenomenon of the energy transition. So the energy mix, you see here something that goes from 2019 with a reference to 2019. And you see all the other sources of energy on the left-hand chart, which go slowly up or go downwards, whereas renewables takes off in a, in, uh, in a big way. Even compared to all the big uh, changes that have happened in the recent past, this change is actually much faster than that. If we are going to be able to reach the scenarios that the world's international energy agency thinks that the world should be driving towards, or all the discussions that are happening around uh, the world that will affect it in that direction. And on the right hand side, you see a fraction of the total energy that the different sources of energy ha will uh, have done or will be used in the future. Uh, and you see going back all, a whole century, but then if you draw the line at 2020, you see how big the changes on the right hand side of 2020 or in the future are with respect to the slow changes with which we have arrived at over the last uh, many decades. And this transition poses in your mind, of course, the total volume of energy we are talking about in 2020 onwards is significantly higher than the energy that we were using, say, decades ago. So it's, in fact, that even says that it's a much larger change that is coming down the the road where we've never been able to affect these kind of changes in the past. The, just to pose in your minds how big and how meaningful and how, how much money it will require and how, what complexity it will have to actually make these changes happen. Now, another view, of course, be, there will be a lot of electrification because both the solar and the wind, the wind turbine or the solar cell, they yield an electron and the electron goes towards electricity. So the electrification process is part of the process of uh, reducing the carbon footprint in the world. And again, you see the, the end of 2020 and assuming that all those cost reductions would happen, uh, at 2020, the proportion of electricity coming from solar and, and uh, wind is actually pretty small when you look at a chart like this and you see the massive change that's going to happen in the next, uh, in, in fact, in this, in this case, there are only three decades represented and you see the, the takeoff of solar and wind and gives you an idea of the size of change that we are talking about and the complexity and hence the difficulty of making something like that happen. Now, of course, because most of this energy comes through electricity or, or, or electrons, then there have to be energy carriers. And the energy carriers, in this case, hydrogen and lithium, which are the two forms of the energy carrier, which the world feels 
are going to make uh, mobility happen in the future. It, when we talk about hydrogen, then we're not only talking about the fact that some cars will be based on hydrogen or we're talking about residential, commercial industries changing towards hydrogen, power industry moving towards hydrogen, mobility moving towards hydrogen in a different way. And then you have to imagine that all those cars would have to change, all those buses would have to change, all the infrastructure for moving the hydrogen from where it is produced to where it is going to be used would have to change. So these are pretty big changes and the same, same applies to lithium at the same time. And these are the two energy carriers that are envisaged are going to basically enable the energy transition to happen. So not only do you have to produce them or to mine them or, or to be able to put them into forms of use, you have to be able to transport them. You have to change the industries that are going to actually be able to use these energy carriers in the future. And then there is the whole idea of energy efficiency. And here there are two charts, but the pay your attention to the right-hand chart. Basically it says that there will be a lot of efficiency technologies which will help us to reduce the footprint, keep the total energy requirement at the same time, even though the world's population increases and GDP continues to increase at a much faster pace. Whereas in the past, GDP and the energy and population have kind of moved together. And of course, as a result of that, the carbon footprint has kept on moving together in the future as well. But energy efficiency technologies will kind of make this diversion happen, whereby the world is able to reduce its footprint, keep its energy usage the same, even though the population keeps on increasing and the world carries on in its growth path in the future. So all of this to say that the energy transition is quite complex and it actually transforms everything uh, that we do in daily walks of life. And then, Taking 2020 as the year of change, there has been a lot of change that has happened in the year of 2020. And uh, you see this transposed on these two charts here where all the other forms of energy actually went down because of the lockdowns we had and the, the reduction in economic and daily activity that happened. But renewables still continue to increase by a, a small percentage as far as the capital expenses to uh, put new renewable uh, uh, plants were concerned, but because there was a much larger infrastructure put in place before, the, the energy usage of, from renewables actually increased quite a lot while all the other energy sources actually went down in 2020. And in the middle of all that, the, all the, the recovery conversations that are being uh, put in place for economic recovery in the world from here onwards, they, they, uh, I just take one chart here to represent the fact that the ESG mandate in the financial world on how finances are going to move into the world of energy is going in the direction that uh, larger and larger ESG requirements will go on to finance or the use of uh, money in the future. So the pace at which basically money will be exclusionary towards high carbon and inclusionary towards a more and more low carbon footprint usages or sources or carriers or all the activity of the energy transition, uh, it's going to increase at a very rapid pace. What that says is that the volume of activity that affects the energy transition is going to keep on increasing. And at the same time, it's gonna create a lot of opportunities in all these areas of change that we are talking about uh, in the world of new energy. At the same time, there are obviously a lot of net zero commitments that have come in. Uh, you see countries from Europe, from China, from the rest of the world who have made these, uh, these stipulations or these laws or regulations which basically say that they commit to move towards a net zero uh, situation in three decades or two decades and so on. And of course there is political talk all over the place, but besides the political talk, there is a lot of economic activity which is moving in this direction to make all of these changes happen. Uh, and of course the recent change in the United States moves the United States much faster in that direction as well. Although the activity in the US moving in this direction is already quite large. And then you see the whole spate of companies including the energy companies who have made their net zero commitments. And so all this says that compared to even say three, four years ago, 
the amount of activity in the world of, uh, let me just use the term new energy as uh, my group is called, in the world of new energy, the activity is going to increase very, very significantly uh, in the coming future. It makes for an exciting time of development, but it is quite challenging from the point of view of the slides that I've shown you, which basically say that this, this is not an easy uh, transition. Uh, it's going to affect us a lot uh, to make all of these fungible, technically fungible, technically economically viable, uh, and for us to be able to affect them in our uh, lives. So I wanted this to be just a, a, a sort of a big picture view on the fact that the energy transition is quite complex. It will transform practically everything. Um, it is going to be slow, slower than what people would like it to be. It's certainly not a very simple linear process and it requires a lot of change. It requires a lot of change in infrastructure, in investment, in the way we work, and uh, uh, certainly is going to affect all of us in a significant way. Uh, I think um, if I were to sort of go back uh, in time a couple of decades, I think uh, we realized, or all of us in the world of technology realized that the digital transition, which uh, was going to be a very big transition that would affect not only the world of ICT or something, but it's going to affect practically every industry in the world, which it is doing now. I think changing energy is about as fundamental as that. Uh, and I think the digital transition together with the energy transition is practically going to affect everything over the coming three decades. Now, while that is in, on, one, on one hand a challenge because it needs to be done so that we reduce our carbon footprint on the world, uh, at the same time, it's a great opportunity of all the new things that are going to happen, the technologies, the innovation that's going to come about to actually make this happen. Um, that, that, with that, I think I'll hand it back to uh, Sandy. If there are some questions, I'm willing to take a question or two at this time. No, no, very good, Ashok. No, thank you very much. So the, as you can imagine, the questions are, are, are flooding in, right, from, from the people. <laughs> So one interesting question was, you know, uh, Sambhaji is obviously one of the premier service companies in the, in, in the energy business. Are you seeing any kind of either regulatory or customer pressure in terms of that, hey, you have to now uh, either monitor or prove your carbon reduction score type of thing, or is this more self-initiated? Uh, just some thoughts on that. Uh, when I when I showed the slide on the ESG mandate, I use the word mandate, but ESG as a scoring or let's say validating uh, rubric for the world is is definitely here to stay. So I think investors are the ones that are going to drive the fact that uh, the ESG mandate for every kind of company is followed. So practically every CEO has. Uh, a, a strategy or as part of his strategy, uh, an objective for uh, the carbon footprint of his own company's operations. And as well at the same time in the world of energy, certainly how his portfolio is going to transform over a period of time towards a cleaner energy portfolio. So uh, regardless of whether you say it's self uh, started or it is part of this movement, you know, it doesn't matter like where you get the, 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 the uh, idea from or who's pushing you, the fact is that every company will work in this direction in the coming future. No, no, very good. Uh, so, you know, uh, Modi ji was very strong in his, in his, in his, in his comments and, uh, you know, he, he pushed us all to really think about the next generation, the future, the younger ones, et cetera. So, there are, or oh, there is a large amount of student attendees among the population. So there are a lot of students all, all over the world uh, listening to you, Ashok. So any message for the students? This is something that I've been consistently asking almost every speaker. I, I think the, the message I would give to the students is that the world of energy and uh, the, this transition is uh, is real. It's happening. Uh, the train kind of left the station. 
uh, and it is a good train to jump on board uh, off, if you like, uh, because there's going to be a lot of very innovative, uh, technical, financial, and uh, industrial activity in the area. So uh, this energy transition is, uh, is going to be providing huge opportunities for people in the future. Now, at the same time, I think uh, the world of oil and gas continues to provide the source of energy to whatever fraction it does today. And uh, oil and gas is going to be required for a long period of time at the same time as well. And we need to continue doing that very efficiently while these portfolios slowly, uh, gradually transform to have a lower carbon content on the current operations and a lower carbon con uh, content in the portfolio in the future. Very good. Now, you know, it's often said that uh, perception winds up being reality more than reality at times. So uh, there's an interesting question here around the perception today seems to be that Europe is slightly ahead and maybe some countries in the Far East. Do you see any kind of geographical gaps between the players as the world uh, migrates towards the energy transition, Ashok? Well, I, I, I think uh, Europe, the, the difference in, uh, from the rest of the world in Europe is that uh, Europe's basically said that their whole economic recovery, uh, a fundamental part of that story is the energy transition. So the hydrogen economy is going to be pushed very hard and so on because it actually creates local jobs. It creates local, it increases the local economy. It makes everyone participate. participate in a new activity which is fungible for the future. And I believe that all of this is going to transpire almost everywhere in the world. Certainly in the United States, people are starting to discuss like that. Uh, and I think this is become, going to become more and more the case everywhere. I don't think Europe is ahead in any sort of uh, activity per se, if you like. It's ahead in uh, believing in this direction and uh, the rest of the world will also uh, believe in this direction in the future, I believe. Sorry, you're muted, Sandeep. Yeah, I, uh, we have Viti Bindra, the co-chair of the, of the conference here. I don't know if he's on. If he's on, uh, Viti, uh, we have uh, maybe a couple of minutes. If there is a question you would like to ask uh, our mutual friend Ashok for the benefit of the attendees. No, first of all, Ashok, thank you very much for making time to come for this uh, event. Uh, we always look for your support and guidance. And I have seen since 2013, the big mega show, which me and Sandy and the team put together in Houston. So thank you once again. So it's been fantastic how your, your, your career path has changed in the last four years from fossil fuel to what you're telling me today. It's like a, it's a totally different world. But no, I really appreciate what you're doing and how you are making the change happen and this fantastic journey you are going through. So all the best to you and we ITNs are supporting you and Cindy might have told you there are more than 10,000 ITNs or 10,000 audience worldwide uh, looking at the program and looking at the session. So you might be loaded with a lot of questions later on. So be ready well, with that. Well, I'm very, very happy to be here. It's good to see you again, Viti. Viti. And uh, I think this is an important subject. I hope it is, uh, I, I, I went through it very fast because I just wanted to put an image in people's mind of what is coming down the road. It is a very exciting area, very challenging area and will make lots and lots of opportunities for people in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Sandeep. Well, thank you, Ashok. I mean, indulging in my pension for the pun, you did give the topic your energy. So that was good. You know, so. <laughs> Trust, trust you to come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ashok, thank you so very much uh, uh, once again. And uh, with that, we'll probably move on to the next speaker, unless there's any other burning question. I think we've covered them all, right, Vidi? I think we're good. Yeah, we have covered them. Thank you. Thank Ashok. you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. So with that, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move to our next speaker <clears throat> on the on the panel. It's uh, my very good friend, uh, Soma Soma Sundaram, if I may call you that, just, just after one meeting over the phone. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Soma is gonna take us through uh, digital chemistry solutions. It was a very intriguing topic that uh, he, he brought to the table. Uh, Soma Soma Sundaram serves as the president of Champion X and their chief executive officer. And he's a member of its board of directors. He previously served in a similar capacity with Apergy Corporation, 
which merged with the upstream's chemical business Nalco, or Champion as you may recognize, in June 2020. Prior to his leadership of Apogee, he served as the Vice President of Dover Corporation and as President and Chief Executive Officer of Dover Energy. Previously, Soma Sundaram served as the Executive Vice President of Dover Energy, EVP of Dover Fluid Management, President of Dover's Fluid Solutions Platform, President of Dover's Gas Equipment Group. Man, is there anything you haven't done, Soma? And President of Dover's RPA Process Technologies. Prior to joining Dover, Soma Sundaram served in various global leadership roles at GLNV Inc., as well as Baker Hughes Inc. Soma Sundaram received a BS in Mechanical Engineering and an MS in Industrial Engineering from the University of Oklahoma. He currently serves as a board member and president of the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. This is an organization some of you may be familiar. It's really designed to generate discussion and deepen knowledge of global issues. Uh, keeping with my train of uh, a, a little personal touch to each introduction, uh, I had the great delight of uh, uh, meeting Soma virtually just uh, a few weeks back, engaging him for the conference. Uh, I also discovered that he does some wonderful work for charities uh, and, and it's just some phenomenal work that Soma does. Uh, and, you know, he'll be as humble as ever. But in just one meeting to a total stranger, the warmth that you exceeded to me, Soma, I thank you for that. I salute that. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Soma, Soma Sundar. Well, thank you, Sandy. And um, I'm really, really delighted to be here. And thanks for that kind introduction. And I really want to appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here, thanks to the, uh, the organizers. Uh, hope everyone is uh, staying safe and healthy. And, um, you know, Ashok did a fantastic job talking about uh, the setting the stage for energy transition in a really, really uh, uh, strategic manner. So what I thought I would do is uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, couple of cases, use cases of how innovations from companies like ours are helping in this world of energy transition, as well as reducing the carbon footprint. So uh, Sandy talked about uh, chemistries and, and, uh, and digital, because those are two big product lines of ours. So I'm going to share a couple of use cases with that. So before we get into it, let me share a couple of uh, thoughts. You know, it's, uh, let's go to the slides here. You know, uh, being in the oil and gas industry, it's really important for us. We always uh, start a meeting with a, with a, with a safety moment. Uh, you know, safety for us is a commitment we make to our employees, our customers, and the communities we live and work. So today I thought I'll touch briefly on the ladder safety. As you know, many of us don't uh, use ladders on our uh, uh, throughout the year, but when it comes to holidays, sometimes we start using the ladders either to hang holiday decorations or, or, or moving boxes and so on and so forth. So just a couple of points around that. Uh, let's uh, make sure when you're using ladders, always ascend and descend facing the ladder. Make sure that we, we, we keep a three-point contact, or you know whether it is two hands and one feet or two feet and one hand, always have a three-point contact. And also I never move the ladder when you're on it. Uh, so that's kind of quick uh, safety moment. Uh, so if we go, if I look at uh, uh, a little bit about our company, so you will get the context when we talk about a couple of those use cases. So uh, we are about 7,000 employees uh, uh, working around the world, a uh, talented group of people uh, working in about 55 different countries in about 250 locations. And we are based here in the, in the Woodlands and we in uh, right outside of Houston and we trade in the New York Stock Exchange. And um, we get about 55% of our three and a half billion dollars of revenue outside of, uh, outside of United States. So we're a fairly global company. We are an equipment and technology company in the energy industry. So we have about 400 scientists who day in and day out work on innovations. And uh, we have, uh, well over 2,500 patents and, and, and counting. 
So uh, what do we do? Uh, so we, we pretty much, uh, you know, play across the hydrocarbon value chain and, and more predominantly around the production well side. So we have, a we have four broad uh, product groups. The first one is uh, what we call it a polycrystalline diamond cutters. So these diamond cutters are used for drilling of oil and gas. And these are where, you know, we are the largest producers of this in the world. And, um, and uh, we typically produced, uh, you know, similar to Mother Earth, we make these diamonds using high pressure and high temperature. Uh, but Mother Earth uh, makes it over millions of years and uh, we try to do it in about 13 minutes. So that's uh, what we do in the diamond side. And then, then as you go into the production phase of the well, you know, we provide a broad set of artificial lift equipment. These are equipment that helps our customers produce oil and gas safely and, 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 and effectively. And then as you move into the chemistry side where we have chemical technologies, these are chemistries that are used to make sure that the oil and gases are flowing more effectively out of the oil and gas wells and reservoirs, as well as, you know, there are a variety of chemistries that protect and, and uh, the equipment and environment uh, to make sure that these hydrocarbons are safely transported as well. And then as you move into the digital side, we, we, we provide an array of digital solutions. We call it fit for purpose solutions that can be as simple as a simple controller that sits in a well site uh, to provide autonomous control to the, the operating well or all the way uh, IIoT, full stack of IoT technologies along with the AI models that helps our customers uh, monitor and uh, manage their wells sitting at their uh, desks in their offices. So th that's a kind of the broad array of things we do. Now, you know, I, I want to share with you something really important for us, which is the, you know, right from the beginning, we are a very purpose-driven company. So we are a journey, a, a purpose-driven journey. And our purpose is improving lives and which is dear and dear to our heart. And the way we do that is unlocking, you know, human and physical energy and we focus on a very strong cultural aspect within the company. And those cultural aspects uh, typically have characteristics around customer centricity, a strong people orientation, developing and deploying technology with positive impact. And more importantly, staying humble and curious. So you are continuously driven to improve all facets of life. So that's kind of uh, our heartbeat as a company is this purpose of improving lives. So now uh, uh, Ashok talked uh, uh, about the energy transition and I thought I'll touch briefly on what's driving the energy transition. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, even when you look at, uh, I kind of summarize it in about five uh, factors. First and foremost is the GDP growth itself is getting less energy dependent. And I think I should touched on it in the sense of energy efficiency. What's driving this is a lot of energy efficiencies and improvement in technologies. So when you think about it between now and 2050, you know, the world GDP is expected to double, but the energy growth is expected to be about 17%. This goes to the divergence of you know, energy growth is going to be only 17% while the world economy of GDP is expected to double. So that's a key element around this energy transition. And following that is the increasing technology innovations. And those technology innovations are really driving the cost of uh, a, a particularly energy, you know, whether in terms of solar, wind, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, battery costs coming down, and then, you know, even when you think about hydrocarbons, significant, significant technology improvements in hydrocarbon producing. To give you an example of what in, in our own world, you know, to, you know, I talked about the diamond cutters we produce. If, if you go back to 2000, a unit of diamond we produced would have removed X number of uh, a rock, you know, as when you're drilling for oil and gas. But today, the diamonds we produce will, are removing 1500 times more rock, the same unit of diamond. So that's the pace of technology 
evolution that has happened. So when you think about where it used to be requiring 2000 rigs to, to produce the kind of oil we, we, we used to produce, today we produce the same number of oil with around 300 and 400 rigs. So all those technology innovations are driving the cost down. So that's the second aspect that's driving the energy transition. Regulatory tailwinds is a big aspect of it, you know, whether it is in terms of uh, price of carbon or phasing out of IC engines. So you saw yesterday, Japan came out and they wanted to phase out IC engines. UK has already announced, California has already announced, France has talked about similar things. And then the increasing consumer pull. I think the consumer sentiments and particularly the recent pandemic is even accelerating it, particularly around remote working, and also around you know, wanting to use energy efficient technologies. And then lastly, the investor sentiment. You know, today, if you look at it, almost 20% of the funds under management you know, did to use some type of a ESG uh, evaluation mechanism. But soon, it's going, it is headed towards 50%. So clearly, investor sentiment is also pulling us towards that. So these are those five factors that's really driving the energy transitions. So when you think about our customers who are predominantly in the hydrocarbon industry, you know, for them, then how do you stay relevant in this area of energy transition? You know, clearly, they, you know, our view is the energy basket over a period of time is going to contain multiple sources of energy. You know, today, while renewables are a small part of it, the energy transition is real, so it's going to get bigger and bigger. But we also hold the viewpoint, even when you get to a time of 2040 or 2050, the hydrocarbons are still going to play a, a very important and a significant role in that energy basket. But what will be required is to make sure those hydrocarbons are produced in the most or in the low carbon way or most efficient manner so that it promotes prosperity around the world, but at the same time, it protects people and planet. So for us, as a, as a, as a part of the oil field services group, it's really, really important. We help our customers continue to be efficient and reduce their carbon footprint by providing technology and solutions that helps them do that. So I want to show you a couple of examples of how we do that. So if you look at... Uh, you know, here's an example. You know, everybody, if you know anything about oil and gas, you probably know Permian Basin. So Permian is one of the largest producing basins of oil in the world. And clearly, you know, when you think about an oil well, when it starts producing, the, it, let's say the life of the well is 40, 50 years, the, the production uh, characteristics or the, the mix of production changes over, over the life of the well. You know, it could be starting out with just oil and, and some water. And over a period of time, it may produce multiple times water or maybe along with that gas and other components. So, the, so protecting the well and making sure the right type of chemistries are applied so that the well can continue to flow well as well as to protect the assets like the pipes, like the downhole equipment. So here's an example where you know, the, while it started off as just a corrosion inhibition, as time went on, you know, the well's characteristic change. And now you are still dealing with a lot more iron sulfides and, and, with, and, and then on top of it, significant amount of scale issues. Now in traditionally, it would have taken three different chemistries to address those. So when you think about three different chemistries, you can think about all the infrastructure needed, how many times trucks have to go to the well site, but we innovated a triple combination chemistry. So which means a single chemistry that can protect, that can be applied to all three of these. Now, I'm not a chemist, but my chemist scientists tell me how hard that is to innovate because to keep it stable in pressures and temperatures. So these are the type of innovations we provide. And when you look at what that does, it has reduced to over 40,000 uh, uh, miles of, uh, you know, traveling. It has, it has reduced, to a, you know, people don't have to travel about 40,000 miles. We have reduced about 55 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. 
you know, getting, uh, and then our customers on top of it have sort of saved about $2 million. So here's a, that's an example of how we innovate around chemistries. Now, let me go to the digital side. So many of you are familiar with pipelines. So when you want to transport natural gas pipelines, you, you know, over hundreds of miles, you require a number of compressor stations to boost pressure so the natural gas can flow through that. Now, there are lots of compressor stations. So here is an example where a customer is using about 2,000 compressors in multiple pipelines. Now, when you use a compressor, there are two issues. Number one, it's highly capital intensive. So you want to make sure that you know, your compressor is always operating at the best optimized value. And then the second is any type of fugitive emissions that will come out of the compressor, either it's due to valve leaking or so on and so forth. So you want to prevent fugitive emissions. So, you know, we, our predictive diagnostic and monitoring technologies, and, you know, we have developed technologies based on physics-based models. We all know this works on a thermodynamic cycle, and so they all work on a physics-based model. But by combining uh, the artificial intelligence models with it, along with the physics models, we are able to yearly detect a lot more of the failure modes, including leak detection, as well as when certain things, components will fail. So if you look at the graph on the right side, so your traditional physics model may, 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 may be able to help you detect a leak occurring probably about four or five days ahead of time. But whereas by using the artificial intelligence model and the historical data, we are able to now advance that to about 14 days before uh, yeah, leak, a leak would occur. So imagine when that happens, you know, when, when that kind of visibility is available to a customer, so they can completely eliminate items, things such as preventive maintenance or redundant capacities. So what you see on the graph here on the left side, you can see how the customers are able to do that. You know, instead of using 2,000 compressors, now they are down to 1,200 compressors. And then on top of it, we are, they are able to reduce all this fugitive emissions by almost 80%. And again, this digital innovations, you know, not just on the hardware side, but also on the software side and the advanced analytics, analytics models as well as failure analysis. So those are a couple of examples of how you know, we help our customers. There are multiple innovations that are going on in this. And I'm excited because in the energy transition is real but hydrocarbons will continue to have an important role to play in it. So I'm excited, you know, we as a company, you know, consistent with our purpose of improving lives, we will play a very relevant role in this energy transition. So with that, you know, want to wish everybody a happy holidays and uh, you can see the graphs around here are the, are the, the kids from our associates sending in their holiday wishes. So we typically make our cards using our uh, you know, kids making holiday cards. So happy holidays, everyone. And with that, Sunday, I would uh, turn it over to you for any questions. Sunday, you may be on. Oh, very good, Soma. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for taking us, uh, taking us through that. Uh, I, I, I love the, you know, the, the, the professional touch, of course, of the corporation, but also this sentiment that I see so strong with you about connecting with your with your employees and their families and so on and so forth. So my my my, my standard question, uh, which I've been asking almost every speaker systematically, because for me, it's about the younger generation about the students, your message as CEO of Champion X Technologies to the many 1000s of students listening to you right now. So I mean, I, I think I would say the first and foremost, you know, look, always stay curious and always stay humble because there is so much to learn. And curiosity, sciences have shown that curiosity is the number one predictor of, uh, of, of success. So staying curious and humble will be really, really important. And I think, uh, you know, my message, you know, is a little along the lines of what Ashok said. The, look, energy transition is real, but I think, you know, you will, you will hear a lot of news around how, you know, one energy will completely, you can eliminate another, another form of energy. So nobody really knows how the energy transition trajectory will look. So stay curious and, 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 and truly, 
you know, we want to have this energy transition to promote continued prosperity of people, economic development of people, at the same time, protect the planet, right? So which means making sure that all forms of energy has an inclusionary aspect, you know, to me is that is important. So, you know, my advice, uh, my counsel to the encouragement to the, to the students is look, you know, look, stay curious, understand the trends, but then innovate around all forms of energy because in order to, all forms of energy will stay relevant. So innovate around all forms of energy. No, no, excellent. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so here's a question and I'm gonna read it exactly as it is because I can see this is a very heartfelt question that's come in. And me being in the oil and gas industry, I can understand the question a little bit more. So maybe you can put context around the question and answer the question, right? It's quite plaintive. So many decades, the oil and gas and energy companies were doing well. Do you think the oil industry will still be doing well after this energy transition? Yeah, so a uh, great question. You know, look, uh, uh, you know, I've been in the oil and gas industry and, you know, so there are two things that are important here. One is the oil and gas industry has to recognize, and we have already recognized mostly that this energy transition is real. So which means, the past practices of oil and gas industry, you know, where, you know, we, we have been very undisciplined about our investments, you know, during the good times, you know, we have been extremely undisciplined about uh, capital allocation. So part of the issue why oil and, you know, the reason today oil and gas industry is not doing well, part of the reason is because our investors have, you know, been soured by the amount of value destruction that has happened in the industry. Now, having said that, what I would say today is the industry is going through a structural transition, and the leaderships and you know leadership have realized the importance of capital discipline. So I think that the, the industry is starting to realize to live within the means. So we are going through a transition period in the industry where we are trying to get healthy. The way I would describe it is, you know, when you're sick, you take bitter medicines to get healthy but eventually you'll get healthy. So I am very positive that we will get healthy. And once we are healthy, we will continue to do well, but the industry will shrink because in part of getting healthy is the industry has to, has to shrink. And then we will, be, we will be doing well as an industry, albeit we'll be somewhat smaller than who we are today. No, very good. Uh, the, that was great, Soma. So we do have a couple of more minutes. So. Maybe I'll do something uh, interestingly different. Let me throw it to the to the other panelists. You know, if uh, uh, Ashok or maybe uh, Ramesh, you had a question for Soma since we have a couple of minutes. If you don't, I'll give Viti the opportunity to ask one. Okay, let me let me let me pull out another question for, here. For me, yeah. for me, these guys are too brilliant to ask any questions. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll make a comment if you allow me to. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, like, I, I'm. Referring to the question that Soma just answered, you know, yeah. this, this existential question or this challenge question to the oil and gas world, you know, uh, I think maybe actually a very interesting uh, parallel industry is the industry of uh, mobility or cars and buses and any kind of mobility, if you like, right? And uh, the fact is that if the energy transition or I shouldn't say if, when the energy transition actually happens. And as Soma said, it'll happen at various pace or in various directions, if you like. Um, there is a definite, you can make a definite statement that all the car companies as you know them today or the mobility companies as you know them today are not going to exist as they are today, for That's sure. True. So if you can somehow imagine that all those people are going to create their own successes then the same applies to the oil and gas world, if you like. You know. All these industries are going to go through this change. And the whole purpose of my talk was to say that the change is much bigger than what one imagines just by saying that there are going to be a few more solar plants and wind, wind turbines, if you like. It's a much more all-encompassing change. And many industries will transform in this, in this sense, you know the cementing industry, the steel industry, the, the aviation industry, all of these industries. So 
these are, you can see them as challenges, but you can also see them as opportunities of where innovation will lead the way, if you like. You know. So you're better off being a leader or follower, but certainly don't want to be a laggard, if you like, if you can. Yeah. No, no, well said, uh, uh, Ashok, and thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Soma. You know, I already commented about the energy that uh, Ashok brought into his presentation. And I can see now that between Soma and Ashok, there's a bit of chemistry developing. So that's good too, you know. <laughs> so with that, we move on to the uh, uh, Soma. So thank you so much, sir. Really, that was, that, that was wonderful. Great uh, to have your thoughts. Uh, we move on to the third speaker for, for this session. Uh, it's, uh, this one is not even so much from here, but from the heart. It gives me incredible pleasure to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, to you. Uh, Ramesh K. Maini, CEO and President of uh, Zentech. Uh, Ramesh has served as a President and CEO of Zentech since Zentech's inception, which he founded more than 40 years ago as one of the founding partners. As the CEO and President, he's managed a variety of oil and gas industry projects, as well as NASA, US Navy, and US Air Force projects. He's personally been involved with major design modifications and enhancements of over 100 marine drilling vessel types and other vessels for wind farm applications, vessels to clean the oceans, and I could go on, but I picked a couple that were in and around this energy transition topic of, of today and the sustainability of energy supply. Uh, Ramesh has actually been carefully selected among the top experts in the industry by uh, International World Oil Panel as most innovative thinker in the oil and gas business. And he was also the winner of the AISE, the American Society of Indian Engineers and Architects Eminent Engineer Award. Uh, Ramesh received his MS degree in structural engineering from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver in Canada, and a degree in civil engineering from IIT Bombay in India. Uh, he is also a fellow of the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. He's a professional engineer in the state of Texas the American Institute of Steel Construction, and the National Society of Professional Engineers. Uh, my usual little personal touch of the, the end of each introduction, I had the great honor and privilege of uh, meeting Ramesh at the Pan-ID conference in 2013. And uh, the, the best words I can use to describe Ramesh on a personal note, he's truly one of the most genuine people that I've ever met in my life. And I have the great privilege of being able to call him my elder brother. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ramesh Maini. Thank you, Sandy. This is way too much. First of all, following Ashok and then following Soma and listening to you, uh, giving me the accolades that I probably don't deserve half of it. But, uh, and by the way, with all the two wonderful talks by these two uh, brilliant gentlemen, it's, uh, it's hard to follow uh, with a little guy like me. I am not a big company like these two gentlemen are with the, big, with the companies they are, but all the same. Um, I wanna say hello to all the brilliant minds in this talk. Um, first of all, Sandy, thank you for even bringing me in, in here. But, uh, and so is Witty, thank you. Um, on top of that, uh, uh, you know, I wanna, I want to thank and congratulate all the uh, volunteers, the IATNs who are supporting uh, this project that uh, uh, all of you all have brought uh, to, to life. And uh, it shows the great uh, credit to the IATNs as a whole, uh, which I'm very proud to be, to be one of them. Uh, at the age of 16, I joined uh, IIT Bombay in 1962 on a five-year course. And uh, uh, those days from high school you went to and it was a five-year course. But after 53 years, I'm still working and uh, enjoying every bit of it. The reason being the brilliant engineers I work with and uh, a lot of my customers and clients, the likes of Ashok, who give us a lot of challenges to bring uh, a lot of good uh, engineering talent. Uh, if you will, uh, um, you know, the topic reinventing here, I'm sorry, I didn't bring any slides. So forgive me for uh, uh, 
stop. So oh, Mac got Alexa here trying yeah. to give me some instructions. So please forgive me for that. Um, but uh, you know, every one of us around here uh, looking at uh, all the things that have happened around us in the industry in the past, currently in the future, they're all have been the reinvention of engineering. You know, every day we, we do something in engineering and I don't know if any profession uh, that, that does what engineering does in any profession, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, cooking food at home or, uh, you know, all of the equipment that comes into it, or whether it is uh, sports, all of the technology that has gone into the sports, whether it is going to the moon and or Mars, uh, that's been all engineering. So this all re those are all uh, reinvention of engineering, if you will. Uh, these brilliant minds that I, I call myself one of them, all the ITNs are such a brilliant mind, they're bringing uh, world over some great results. Every day you all bring the most out of each industry. I can't talk about each profession or each industry. I can only talk about uh, the industry that Ashok has talked about and so much talked about, that's the oil and gas industry. Uh, since 1972, I've been in this industry and uh, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with lots of great people. Uh, as a company, we design, we build, and we perform construction management on a uh, number of mostly offshore, but some onshore drilling rigs. So even in the oil and gas industry as a company, we're in a small part of drilling rigs. What I want to tell you, is, uh, and uh, you know, these uh, brilliant people are on the on the panel here. They already know all these things. But you know how in the 50s we were on land, in the 60s we start going in shallow waters, and then in the 70s, 1880s we went into midwater depth, like 500 meters, and then in 90s and uh, went into 1500 meter water depth, and then now in the 20s we're uh, going into, you know, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 10,000, 12,000 for water depth, which is about 3,500 meter water depth. That's uh, reinventing engineering, if you will. And uh, we've been part of it, a lot of that development. And, uh, you know, the, the all elements of engineering, whether it is uh, naval architecture, whether it's uh, structural, mechanical, electrical, metallurgical, all the engineering disciplines uh, perform in this uh, field. Uh, you know, of course, the people present here know all about drilling rigs, but uh, people who may not know about the drilling rigs, you know, it's an island that floats, uh, that moves from uh, country to country, from the ocean to oceans, that can drill anywhere in the world, whether it's in the very heavy storms, or whether it is very cold environments, or whether it's very warm environments. Uh, we have to have all kind of mechanical means to have weather, uh, you know, capability to withstand weather, uh, whether it's in winter or it's in summer. So we have ACs, we have heat, uh, we have to have the steels that are designed and uh, used for weathering all kind of uh, uh, conditions. Uh, you know, some 200 people live on board uh, these days uh, that serve the industry working 24-7, 365 days a year, whether it's Christmas, whether it's Thanksgiving, whether it's Diwali, whether it's the Shara, people still work on board uh, two shifts a day and uh, perform. Uh, looking at the technology from a uh, reinventing engineering standpoint, we started drilling in 5,000 PSI, something 350 bars. Uh, we went on to, in the 1780s, went down to 10,000 PSI, some three, 700 bars. And then in the 90s, we start 80s and 90s, we went into 15,000 PSI. Now we're in 20,000 PSI and still growing, maybe even 25,000 PSI in 3,000 and more. But all the other reasons uh, that we're doing things that uh, help us. Imagine being in 3,000 meter water depth and then drilling still four, five, six, seven kilometers in the ground to produce oil and, oil and water. Those are all some engineering talent that uh, uh, that has been brought in 
brought on by, by the brilliant minds. I, I say all these things is because of the youngsters who are there in the industry, despite uh, all the other uh, news about how bad some people think oil and gas has been, uh, we all know that oil and gas is not gonna disappear. The brilliant minds are gonna still continue bringing a lot of the great things. So, you know, uh, you know there are other innovations that have taken place like the horizontal drilling. Used to be we drilled 10 wells, we find one successful well. Now we probably do more like one out of two wells. Those are all the innovations of uh, engineering. Shale oils and oil sands and uh, all of these are newer innovations. We are working on some of the marginal fields right now. You know, there were times when marginal fields were left alone and we're working on developing those, uh, not only just we, but industry as a whole. But, you know, against all odds, when everybody is against the oil industry, we all have to reinvent ourselves to other engineering sites. So the wind uh, producing energy, uh, solar, energy, solar energy, the thermal energy in the ground, uh, wave induced energy and or like the likes of Bill Gates who has come up with uh, brilliantly uh, safer ways of having nuclear power. These are all going to be the newer technologies that are gonna solve at least the power related problems, but oil and gas is still never gonna disappear. So, you know, as an industry, the innovations are many, many more. Uh, look at the virtual reality, look at augmented reality, artificial intelligence. Uh, we all are working in predictive analytics now to where we can look at the equipment from all aspects to give it a longer life. We are using virtual reality, using 3D cameras to scan structures that we can know within one to two millimeter accuracy, how we can modify equipment on the, on the vessels or drilling rigs or platforms, or even the uh, other kind of vessel that are uh, confined environment. So, you know, uh, all of this thing is resulting in more and more innovations that are resulting in better, safer, uh, you know, productive uh, uh, aspects for human um, resources and human needs. Uh, so, you know, as a company and as an industry, uh, our industry has been always looking forward to doing more and more things. Um, you know, recently uh, we uh, tried to come up with something newer. For example, all ships, boats, barges, drilling rigs, plat offshore platforms, they, we all have ballast tanks which are uh, using salt water. And uh, you see that every, after a few years of uh, a new construction, all of them develop corrosion. Uh, we have recently gone into where we can uh, without entering a tank, we can scan a tank and show you the condition of the tank, whether it is in good condition or in corroded condition, as if you're sitting two inches, I mean, uh, a foot away from it, looking at it like you're there in that room. You could never do that before. Without any light, without any human intervention, we can scan a tank and tell you what the condition is. And then you decide if there is something has to be done. In the past, there have been thumb rules to modify structures because there's thumb rules says 15% loss replaces steel. We can now prove to you sometimes even 30%, 35% loss is not necessarily uh, replacement or sometimes even 5% has to be replaced depending upon where in the structure that's a problem. This is predicting and you know creating assets to have a longer life. The intent is that we are all, especially in our industry, we're struggling to keep the economy in such a way that the costs are brought down. So we're working towards some of these aspects to bring the cost down. The ballast uh, uh, water treatment, uh, the, the escape gas gases from the engine rooms, all of that has been newer laws as uh, Ashok talked about uh, carbon capture and as uh, Soma talked about uh, some of these things. We're all are working towards that. This is the beauty for all the youngsters, Sunday, as you ask. They are gonna be looking at all of these things. 
And you know, we went into crack, crack propagation studies where if you had a small crack or inclusion, we could actually predict how long it'll be before that crack becomes uh, non-effective uh, to where you have to do something about it. In the past, we look at a crack and we say, oh man, this, is, uh, this, this equipment or this structure is going to fall. In the reality, that is not always so. Uh, the CFD studies that uh, industry does where even when we have a ship rolling at the very, under very, very heavy storms, uh, how the liquids are hammering the tank walls and the roof and the, the bottom of the tanks, uh, you can actually predict what's happening and how you can design things. Those are all some interesting uh, uh, engineering aspects that, uh, you know, the likes of the ITNs that are going through schools are going to use. But we have some other challenges. Uh, for example, there are over 8 billion tons of plastic flo floating around the world. You know, we talk about green energy and we talk about uh, windmills and other things but somebody's going to have to work towards uh, removing all these plastics. Some of us are very keen on eating seafoods and uh, you know some of this plastic that are floating around is also coming back into our own stomachs when we so-called enjoy seafood. So we have to work towards one. Now you know another aspect of windmill industry that very few people have looked at it, some 20 years ago we started installing windmills the blades that now those windmills are being uh, dismantled because bigger and bigger windmills are coming up that can generate a lot more power, economic, less pricing than the old ones were. So they are discarding or dismantling some of these old ones. These blades are 75, 80 meters long or 200, 250 feet long. You cannot move them easily. If you cut them, that's a fiberglass material. There are not very many uses for all that. So some somebody, some other youngsters are going to come up with uh, better engineering uh, uh, capabilities to have to figure out how to, uh, you know, uh, discharge those things. We can't just call West Management and come here, pick up these blades, and they'll do something with it. They can't. And the future blades that are about 108 meters long, 325 feet long, if you will, they have to. They're made out of carbon fiber, and as I understand from a lot of people. They don't even have an answer yet. What are they going to do when those uh, those blades have to come back and have to be dismantled? So these are some of the other innovative things that uh, people have to come about. Uh, and the youngsters, I'm sure, will come up with a lot of things. So for me, uh, working as, as old as I am, the exciting part has been working with brilliant people who all think great things. And I learn and enjoy around them. The likes of Ashok Ken Soma brings a lot more things into the industry and I, I enjoy those things uh, as well. In closing, I have a request. You know, Indians are in general all over the world are doing very well. We have uh, Indians have brought a lot of good name to India and uh, world over really appreciate what we all do. I just like everybody to be proud of all the other Indians. Uh, we should be a team that really uh, look at each other and, uh, and look at our kids, look at uh, other people's kids and really appreciate each other because that's something that we don't do very well. Um, maybe I'm wrong in saying that one, but that's something is a request that uh, we should all do. We should all praise each other thoroughly because we all deserve it. And uh, a good praise brings the best out of everybody. So with that, Sandy, I said Jai Hind, but uh, if there is any question, which I doubt there's anybody gonna have any question, but uh, I still am ready to answer if I know something. Thank Sandy. you, Ramesh, I appreciate it. Uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming from, from, from the heart. I know we had a bit of a, an issue about slides and uh, it might've been easier, but uh, thank you for that. And uh, so I'm not going to ask you the standard question that I ask all the other speakers about your message for students because you did uh, address this in your speech, but maybe a slightly different question, which is, uh, you know, you saw that very plaintive question about, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to oil and gas? Uh, you know, Ashok uh, addressed what they are potentially looking to do from uh, uh, their company point of view, and uh, Soma looked at it from uh, Champion X's point of view. So, any thoughts around that as to 
survival techniques, I guess, if nothing, if to, to, for want of a better phrase, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't believe the oil and gas is going to totally disappear. Okay, even hundred years from now, it's going to be there, and there's going to be more and more research and better things going to happen. You know, we're already doing all sorts of things about trying to take care of the pollution, take care of the exhaust, you know, the, the dumping of ballast water in the sea. We're doing all kinds of things as an industry. So yes, you know, it's good to have some of the challenges. It brings the best out of everybody. Uh, Asoma was right. I think Ashok said that there'll be some, uh, you know, some of the uh, companies will probably merge with others and there'll be some shortage, but you know, uh, we went through 80s the same way what we're going through right now in the oil and gas industry. We've always come out with the bigger and better things and done well. Uh, I, I have no doubt in my mind, I may not be around to see it, but I think things are gonna be always uh, going on. But it's always exciting to see other innovations that happen and the youngsters are all gonna be working toward all of that. I don't know if I answer your question, but uh, that's all I can say. No, no, that's 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 fair enough. You know, this is uh, uh, each person has a, a, a different strategy, if, if if you may. So we still do have uh, uh, two three minutes. So I thought maybe we could uh, maximize the time. I'll throw it out to the uh, speakers again. I haven't got any questions being fed in from the audiences yet, but I'll throw it out to the 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 other uh, speakers that went before you, uh, Soma, Ashok. If you have any questions. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it may be interesting, uh, uh, the, the panel panelists here, uh, to ask, uh, obviously, everybody talks about peak demand for oil, uh, you know, so if they have to make uh, their educated guess, uh, their own personal guess, when, uh, roughly when we may expect a peak demand of oil, that could be interesting to see the different perspective. Okay, that's that's interesting. I mean, this was actually structured as a series of three keynotes. It's it's interestingly morphed into a panel, but it's great as long as it's adding value to the attendees. So maybe I'll throw that question in the same order as we went. Ashok, maybe I'll throw that to you first. We did have a discussion about tough questions, right? So, <laughs> well, yeah, I think uh, there's uh, obviously questions around what how what the demand scenarios are going to look like in the near future. Um, and whether the peak actually peaks at a hundred or I, I, I think the, it's not, the, the, that's kind of like a, a tick in the ball, or let's say it's just a number and a discussion if you want, right? What is the fact is that uh, demand is slowly creeping back up. Uh, once the life comes back, it'll get back up to the 96, 97 million barrels. At 96, 97 million barrels, the world's going to have a tough time to produce because of the low investment that has happened over the last uh, uh, so many quarters and is going to continue for maybe a few more. Uh, so there will be tightness for, uh, I don't know how long that tightness will be based on how big the, the gap is. And in that case, does the price go up to a very high point where uh, people start uh, belting up on the demand again. We, we don't know that, you know. And, and this, as we said, this transition is real now for sure. Right. And what pace it will continue at or exactly what the numbers are going to be in various aspects are not the, the main question. The main question is, uh, how do you innovate fast? How do you bring these economics to the right place very quickly? Um, for that matter, by the way, oil activities may be thwarted just because of the fact that people don't like the footprint that oil has. Who knows? You know, I mean, the the world might transition in a very different way in the next few years. So, very good. I think there are different aspects that one has to yeah. consider about the energy transition. I mean, and and, and on that note, I guess uh, with the permission of the other participants, of the destination is clear. It's just how quick you get there. Uh, on that note, I'll close this out because we are we are just out of time. But with all sincerity uh, from here, Ashok, thank you so much. Uh, Soma, thank you so much. Ramesh, thank you so much. And uh, we will look forward to continuing our discussion, hopefully when COVID is over, over possibly a glass of wine or beer. Really appreciate it, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much. And Viti, both of you.
Thank you. I would have called Thank him. He's not. He's gone for the next one. So take care, guys.